pleasure to welcome you to Christ Chapel at Gustavus Adolphus College for our 39th annual May Day Peace Conference, War on the Press at Home and Abroad. We gather to pause from our normal Wednesday activities and to focus our attention on the experiences and leadership of journalists who are working to build a more just and peaceful world. We are part of an international celebration this week since May 3rd is World Press Freedom Day. Let us begin together with a moment of prayer. Holy One, known by many names, we gather this morning to deepen our understanding about the ways that we make for a more just and peace-filled world. To that end, may we move beyond indifference and complacency so that we might contribute our talents to the world's renewal. May we lift up visions that inspire peacemaking movements, recognize the dignity of human beings, unite the insights and scholarship of many disciplines, and lift up the wisdom of sages, prophets, and saints. Let us commit to becoming ever more impassioned and compassionate people. May we find the courage to be ethical leaders. May we foster behavior to preserve and enhance our communities. As we are enriched by this time together, let us celebrate the times that we are co-creators of a better world and the moments when we build a legacy of encouragement and hope. Amen. Now I welcome Dr. Samuel Kessler to join me in sharing a Jewish prayer for peace. May we see the day when war and bloodshed cease, when a great peace will embrace the whole world. Then nation will not threaten nation, and humanity will never again know war. For all who live on earth shall realize we have not come into being to hate or to destroy. We have come into being to praise, to labor, and to love. Compassionate God, bless the leaders of all nations with the power of compassion. Fulfill the promise conveyed in scripture. I will bring peace to the land and you shall lie down and no one shall terrify you. I will rid the land of vicious beasts and it shall not be ravaged by war. Let love and justice flow like a mighty stream. Let peace fill the earth as the waters fill the sea. And let us say, Amen. Amen. It is now my pleasure to welcome Gustavus President Rebecca Bergman to the podium for a greeting. Thank you all for being here today to celebrate May Day and for being part of the greater Gustavus community. It's really wonderful to see the chapel filled. The annual May Day Peace Conference was established at Gustavus Adolphus College in 1981. May Day is the international distress call those who hear it are called to respond. Likewise, our May Day Peace Conference was established to inspire attendees to take action, to respond for peace and justice throughout the world. And so over 35 years later, the purpose for this conference is equally as relevant as the year it was started. Gustavus today has a new vision statement that says that we will equip our students to lead purposeful lives and to act on the great challenges of our time. We know that many of the great challenges of our world are linked to issues of justice and peace. I'm so pleased that you are here today and hope that you will leave inspired to work in your local or global community for peace. 
This conference was started and underwritten with funding by the late Florence and Raymond Sponberg. We are deeply grateful for their vision for this conference. And now today, please join me in welcoming the Sponberg children, Michael, Miriam, Elaine, and Anne. Would you all please stand to receive our thanks for your continued support of this conference. Today's conference is especially important because it's a testimony to the power that a teacher might have on a student. Gustavus alumna Miriam Sponberg Kegel, whom we just acknowledged, was a high school English teacher of Thomas Friedman. <laughs> Seriously. in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. The two of them have stayed in touch and we are very grateful for this relationship that has allowed for the visit by Mr. Friedman today. And a special thank you to the 2019 conference committee that is listed in your program and especially to Dr. Mimi Gerstbauer, professor in political science and the Peace, Justice and Conflict Studies program who has served as chair for the May Day Conference Committee. It is now my pleasure to invite forward Dr. Gerstbauer, who will read the citation for the conferral of an honorary degree. I also welcome forward Mr. Friedman and Chaplain Siri Erickson, as well as Dr. Sam Kessler, who will assist with the doctoral hood. Today, Gustavus Adolphus College honors internationally renowned author, reporter, and columnist Thomas Friedman. In 1981, Friedman started working at the New York Times. He served as Beirut Bureau Chief and Jerusalem Bureau Chief. His reporting earned him the Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting in 1983 and 1988. Drawing from these experiences, his first book, From Beirut to Jerusalem, won both the National Book Award for Nonfiction and the Overseas Press Club Award for Best Book on Foreign Policy in 1989. That same year, Friedman became the Times Chief Diplomatic Correspondent based in Washington, D.C. For the next four years, he traveled the world covering Secretary of State James Baker and the end of the Cold War. In 1992, he became Chief White House Correspondent, where he covered the post-election -elect transition and the first year of Bill Clinton's presidency. Friedman took over the New York Times Foreign Affairs column in 1995, where he writes on conventional issues like conflict, traditional diplomacy, and arms control, and has also worked to broaden the definition of foreign affairs to include the globalization of markets and finance, environmentalism, and technology. This intersection of old and new was the inspiration for his second book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, Understanding Globalization, published in 1999 and winner of the Overseas Press Club Award for Best Book on Foreign Policy in 2000. Friedman travels extensively in an effort to anchor his opinions in his first-hand experiences on the ground. He also intentionally writes in a way to be accessible to the general reader, to bring a broader audience into the foreign policy conversation. He won a third Pulitzer Prize in 2002 for distinguished commentary related to the global impact of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Some of the other books published by Friedman include The World is Flat, A Brief History of the 21st Century, which received the inaugural Goldman Sachs Financial Times Business Book of the Year Award. The international bestseller, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, addressing the challenges of climate change as an opportunity to revitalize America's global leadership, and his most recent book published in 2016, Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist Guide to Thriving in the Age of Accelerations, which was his seventh New York Times bestselling book. 
In addition to numerous honorary degrees and other awards, Friedman has been awarded the Overseas Press Club and National Press Club Awards for Lifetime Achievement and the honorary title Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II. President Bergman, for his contributions through journalism to help the greater public deliberate some of the greatest challenges of our globalized world and its accelerating pace of change. And upon recommendation of the faculty, I hereby present Thomas Friedman for the honorary degree, Doctor of Humane Letters. Hold tight, you'll get to do that again. For your unwavering efforts as a journalist to uncover and speak truth, and to engage in open debate that is a pillar of freedom, Gustavus Adolphus College is privileged and honored to bestow an honorary degree upon you, Thomas Friedman. And now, by the virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Gustavus Adolphus College, and upon the recommendation of the faculty and approval of the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you, Thomas Friedman, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, with all of the rights, privileges, and honors pertaining hereto. Many of us have read books or commentary by Mr. Friedman. His thoughts may inspire, challenge, and sometimes potentially anger us. Like a good journalist, he is not necessarily looking for consensus among his readers, but for engagement in the topic. He often is calling us to think, learn, and then act on our convictions. This morning, we are very pleased to have Rashini Rajkumar with us to conduct an interview with Mr. Friedman. Ms. Rajkumar is a multimedia content creator, crisis coach, and former TV reporter. She hosts her own show on WCCO radio and a new podcast called Real Leaders with Rashini. And I know she is looking forward to a fabulous conversation with Mr. Friedman. I now welcome you both to have a seat up front and we look forward to the following interview. Thank you. That's heady stuff. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I finally have something over Mim because my, my teacher, she only has a BA from Gustavus. I have a doctorate now. <laughs> it's a fun day when you can be here with your teacher you better to see it. that. It's the best. So in preparation for today, I, I posted just to kind of add to the excitement that all of us on campus, everyone on campus, that I was feeling as I came into town, I posted on Facebook the link from Gus Davis's website about this today. And I got on a plane yesterday in San Francisco, got off the plane, checked my Facebook, and there were tons of impressions, lots of comments, lots of people who are fans of yours. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to go read those comments. Sure, sure. But my sense, and today our topic is war on the press, mm -hmm. my sense is not everybody uh, calls you this great man yes. and, oh, Rashini, have fun chatting with yes. him tomorrow. <laughs> Have Your you, sense is accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever truly felt under attack? Let's start with physically. Um, 
Well, first of all, I just want to thank the president, the faculty, the Gustavus community. This is a great honor. Um, and any day I can do a good deed for, for Mim uh, is a good day for me. So thank you all very much. Let's start there, you know. Um, Mim, this is being live streamed, so everyone in the world <laughs> is, is watching and hearing that. Uh, so uh, I was the New York Times, first I was the, you know, can I just step back and, and sure. maybe just talk for five minutes, how I got here, um, you know, uh, because um, I, uh, it, it's all kind of connected. I, um, uh, I was blessed to have had some really inspiring teachers in high school um, uh, who taught me a love of writing. Um, uh, uh, one was Mim and her, her class on uh, British poets, which uh, um, she reminds me I always wasn't fully embracing of Shelley and, and Byron and the others, but um, uh, she started a, uh, a literary magazine at our high school, uh, which I was on, and then I had a great journalism teacher uh, in high school, uh, Hattie Steinberg, and I was on the newspaper. And um, the only writing courses I've ever taken are those two courses. Um, uh, not because I was that good, but because they were that good, okay? So um, uh, I eventually went to Brandeis. I studied Arabic and Middle East history. I did semesters at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and the American University in Cairo. I was interested in the Middle East from a very early age. I, I had a Marshall Scholarship and uh, went to graduate school uh, at Oxford and had a classic British Arabist education. Um, while I was over in the UK, um, in London, it was 1975, and I was walking down the street with my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, in London, and um, the Evening Standard, which is the evening newspaper there, they always have these blaring headlines, you know, Brad to Jen, we're finished kind of thing, you know. And, um, and the blaring headline uh, that day, because uh, Carter was running uh, against Ford for president, and the, um, uh, the blaring headline said, Carter to Jews, colon, if elected, I promise to fire Dr. K. And I saw that headline, and I said to my then-girlfriend, now wife, isn't that interesting? Jimmy Carter's running for president. He's trying to win Jewish votes by promising to fire the first ever Jewish Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. And I thought about what's that about, and for whatever reason, it prompted me to go back to my dorm room and write a column about it. And um, my then girlfriend, now wife, happened to be a neighbor of Gilbert Cranberg, who is the legendary editorial page editor of the Des Moines Register. My wife's from Des Moines. And she took my column home on vacation, walked it over to Gil's house. He liked it, and he printed it on a half page of the Des Moines Register with a big Alf cartoon, and they <laughs> paid me $50. That's a big day. <laughs> and I thought that was the coolest thing in the whole world. I was walking down the street, I had an idea, I wrote it up, and someone paid me $50. And the connector was your wife. My right. sense is that paved the way to marriage. That was a big deal. That was like, that was, <laughs> could have been the tipping point. And uh, <laughs> so throughout college, I actually wrote op-ed pieces about the Middle East for the Des Moines Register and the Minneapolis Star and Tribune for Harold Chucker, who was in the op-ed page editor there. So when I graduated from college, I applied to AP and UPI in London to be a, a journalist. I decided I didn't want to go into academics. I wanted to be in the field. Um, and uh, all I had to, to sell myself were 10 op-ed pieces on the Middle East. And AP looked at it and said, kid, you've never covered a fire. You've never even covered a city hall meeting. Uh, get lost. And UPI took a chance on me. They said, well, if you could do this, you could, we could probably teach you to do that. And you studied Arabic in college, and the Iranians just had a revolution, and they seemed to have the same squiggles, so um, uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll hire you. It really wasn't much more sophisticated than that. And I was in London for nine months, and um, the number two man in the Beirut Bureau of UPI got shot um, in the ear by a man robbing a jewelry store on the main street in Beirut. And he called back uh, to the office and said, I want to go home. Uh, I do not want to pass go. I do not want to collect $200. I want to leave. And they came to me. I was all of, uh, you know, uh, 20, uh, 24 then. And they said, uh, would you like to go to Beirut? So this was in the middle of the Lebanese Civil War. This is uh, now 1979. And, of course, I jumped at it uh, as an opportunity. And um, uh, we went off to Beirut in, in June 1979. And the first night at the Commodore Hotel, I heard gunfire. And that was actually the first gunshot I'd ever heard in my life. Uh, little did I know, I hear many more. So I spent the first two years there in the middle of a civil war. 
And so, of course, uh, there were moments of, uh, you know, of, of fright and, and you were close to violence all the time. But um, you were close to that violence because it was violent around you, it was not violent because everywhere. you were a journalist. Exactly. Yeah, it was not targeted at you. But then things started to, so then I got hired by the New York Times um, in, in, uh, in 1981. They brought me back to New York for nine months. I was an oil reporter because that was the opening they had. And then they sent me back to Beirut in April 1982. And Israel invaded Lebanon six weeks later. And it became the biggest story um, uh, on the planet for the next two years. So I covered the Israeli invasion, the siege of Beirut, uh, the PLO leaving, the Marines coming, the Sabrin Shatila massacre, the uh, embassy bombing of the US embassy, the, the uh, Marine bombing. Um, and uh, all of those involved, you putting yourself, of course, in, in harm's way. But, um, that's what you do if you're going to be a foreign correspondent in the middle of a civil war. And so, you know, the day the um, embassy bombing happened um, in 1983, uh, April 1983, it just um, past the anniversary, uh, we were living in Beirut, and um, uh, it happened to be that was the day the Pulitzer Prizes were going to be announced. And the Times thought I had a chance to win, and I was at my apartment in Beirut. Uh, it was 1.06 p.m., and I had something on my desk, it was called a transistor radio. Hmm. And um, uh, at 1.06 p.m., there was a blast so powerful, I was listening to the BBC 1 o'clock news, that it flipped my radio off my desk onto the floor. And I did what you do as a foreign correspondent, I ran downstairs. Um, uh, the Israeli jets often set off sonic booms over Beirut, so you can't tell the difference between a sonic boom and an explosion unless you hear sirens. And if you hear sirens, you know that it wasn't a sonic boom. So I started to hear sirens, and I began to see a mushroom cloud curl up um, uh, in the distance, and I, I did what a journalist did. I ran toward it. And as I got closer and closer, I started to say, no, no, it couldn't be. It couldn't be. And then I turned a corner, and there was the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, where I'd visited so many times, cut in half like a doll's house. Uh, smoking fire and um, people literally hanging from, you know, from floors. And um, I don't remember exactly when it happened, but I ran into Ryan Crocker, who was then the um, junior political officer at the embassy. He, he, he later became one of our most legendary ambassadors in the Middle East. And um, I asked him what happened, and he said a man uh, driving a pickup truck drove up the front steps of the embassy. In those days, embassies had no perimeters. You just walked in the front door. And he blew up the truck in the middle of the lobby. And I said, you mean he committed suicide? And that just seemed like the most unreal thing to this kid from Minnesota, that somebody drove a truck into the middle of the lobby, the embassy, and I said, you mean he killed himself? And little did I know, that was the first of a phenomena that would actually shape my entire time in the Middle East. So, uh, yeah, there were times I was close to things. Uh, you know, I was once interviewing, Ar Ar interviewing Arafat when the Israelis were bombing the neighborhood. You could feel the oxygen sucked out of a room when a blast hits, you know. Um, but I, I don't really think about those things. What to me, what I remember most is not that I was close to something. Hopefully, I'm not, I was close to the but once that I could hear it. Perform. You can actually hear it turning. Um, and uh, once at the embassy, uh, at the airport. But what I remember most is that um, what is, if there's anything good about living and working in the Civil War as a journalist, and I'm not a voyeur, this is not voyeuristic, it's that what you get to see in a Civil War is unlike anything you get to see anywhere else. You get to see the full rainbow of human emotions. You know, you live in Minneapolis or grow up in St. Louis Park, you saw red, green, and blue. Oh, when you're in a civil war, you see every color of the rainbow. You see what people are capable of for incredible evil. And you see what people are, in, are capable of, of amazing kindness in the middle of a war. And you, so your whole sense of what human beings are capable of gets really widened in a way you would never experience anywhere else. And that affected me forevermore. Because I saw... I saw people do some incredibly evil and depraved things. How has that spectrum and, and seeing it, experiencing it, how has that affected your writing? 
Well, it, it affected uh, to the point of your conference here. Um, it makes you realize that peace happens not when people uh, just decide to understand each other better. That the natural state of affairs of nation states is a jungle environment. And peace happens when three things come together, it seems to me. Uh, one is when you have a benign hegemon, uh, a, a power that keeps the peace. Uh, the world is the way it is because America is the way it is. Uh, 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 since and you still believe Since that. World War II, very, very much so. Um, it happens when people engage in trade and, and, and commerce and, and have a mutual interest in thriving together. And it happens where democracy is present because democracies do not, for the most part, fight wars. And those are the three conditions. So if you look at Europe after two world wars, you know, what, 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 what does Europe have in common today? You have, a, you have a power that's enforcing rules, you have incredible economic commerce through the EU, and you have the spread of values of democracy and freedom. And when those three things are present, you have, you have peace. When just one of them is present, you can have a benign hegemon, but without commerce and without democracy, um, it's not going to be sustainable. You can have democracy, but without someone keeping the peace and economic commerce, it won't be sustainable. And it's really those three conditions together are what make peace possible. That was what I took away from my experience. So for that first part of your career with the Times and prior, you were a journalist, you were a reporter, yeah. you were reporting the news. But then nearly 25 years ago, you became a columnist. And as someone who's a past reporter, now a talk show host yes. myself, there is a real distinction between reporting and having an opinion. And unfortunately, it's gotten, right, the lines are squiggly and yeah. blurry. How do you define for our audience what your role is as a columnist? Well, you know, uh, the best way I can explain it is to go take you back to Beirut. Um, in the first week of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, um, my apartment in Beirut was blown up and my driver's wife and two daughters were killed in my office. Um, and uh, it was one of the worst days of my life. I had to help dig them out of the rubble of my office. And his daughter was holding my watch, which she was obviously playing with when the blast hit. Um, what happened was two groups of refugees had taken over the building um, and my driver, who was Palestinian, to, um, felt that it wasn't safe for me to live there, so he put his family there um, uh, I moved to the Commodore Hotel, so when refugees came, his, they would just say, hey, we're refugees too. And two groups of refugees got in a fight over the building, and the one that lost blew it up. Um, uh, an act of incredible uh, uh, depravity. Um, the New York Times would not let me write that story. Now think about that. Mm -hmm. Their answer was, hey, do you know how many other people's apartment were blown up today? Um, you are not the story. The story is the story, and you're there to cover it. And if your apartment happened to be blown up, that's tragic. Of course, they were full sympathy, but you're not the story. If that happened today, you'd be in, today if you get a little cut, you Instagram it, tweet it, um, you know, uh, <laughs> look at me, I'm in the middle of, my yes. apartment was blown up. Yeah. I'm the New York Times bureau chief. My driver's wife and two daughters were killed there, and they said that not news. We are not the news. Now we eventually wrote a small story about it because everyone else was writing about it. Mm -hmm. So that was how I was raised as a journalist. Right. Um, you are not the story. Right. So that's why I am not on Twitter. I am not on Facebook. I am not on Instagram. You will not see me anywhere other than the New York Times. Now, the New York Times tweets my column out um, and I'm, I'm glad for that. It's now a really important uh, channel to reach people. But um, I had that pounded into me. So that's, that's what it means to be a reporter. You know what I mean? Is the New York Times, would they still make that decision today? I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think they would go to the extreme that others would, but um, uh, today that just wouldn't happen. The natural instinct of the reporter would be to tweet. I think reporters tweeting is just wrong, um, uh, unless it's just, these are the facts. But uh, it's very hard in this age where reporters' opinions creep into that. So we have a real, uh, uh, wall in the paper between the editorial side and the news side. We have an editorial page editor, James Bennett. Um, we have a news editor, Dean Becquet, and they both report separately to the publisher of the paper. And that's so the news reporters can say, hey, you didn't like Tom Friedman's column? I have nothing to do with Tom Friedman's Nor do column. I care. Nor do I care. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, we can say, I don't, I don't like your reporting. Mm -hmm. This is how I see the story. Yeah. So there's a real wall between the two. 
So I went from not being able to report on my own apartment being blown up to a job where I'm paid to have an opinion. That is my job. Is that kind of fun? Um, it's the most fun you can have legally that I know of. Um, it's, uh, uh, illegally, I can think of some ways, but legally, it's the most fun. Because um, uh, I get to be a tourist with an attitude. Right. I get to go wherever I want, whenever I want. I have the most amazing job. The New York Times came to me uh, in 1995. They said, here's an American Express, American Express card. Go write two interesting columns a week and um, uh, come see us every once in a while. And so they have... That is amazing. Yeah. So I have no budget. I've never, ever been told not to go anywhere. Uh, they have no idea I'm here today, that I was in Wilmer on Monday, and that, you know, I was in India the week before. I go wherever I want, whenever I want, and I write whatever I want. The only person who sees it before you do is a copy editor who says it's Gustavus, you know, with a G. That's it, okay? <laughs> um, uh, and um, so I have incredible freedom. As long as I write interesting things and do it well, compellingly, and accurately. I've, I've been a columnist for the Times now since 1995. I've had colleagues fired uh, over the years. This is not like a Supreme Court seat. You know, you gotta do your job. And, and, but the job is not to be left or right. The job is to be interesting and compelling um, and, uh, and, 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 and um, uh, write things that people will, will um, like, hate, talk about. You know, well, let's talk about that way. because there are some people who haven't liked some of the political yes. stances you've taken, sure. whether it's on Iraq yeah. or uh, the Saudis, whatever it yeah. is, pick a topic. Yeah, please. How do you handle that? Do you not care? Do you respond to those writers, mm -hmm. those readers yeah. who write you? So, um, so because I'm not on Twitter, everybody likes me. I mean, my world, you know, um, uh, it's... Uh, it's really great. Um, uh, so um, I, this job, to do it right, this is not a friend growth industry. And um, I'm not out to be popular. And I'm not out to be part of some Twitter consensus. I could not care less. I cannot emphasize how little I care. And that's um, the trade-off for the okay. Free American Express card. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, you better yeah. believe it. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm indifferent right. to uh, criticism. And um, I'm keenly aware First of all, I have a wife who edits every column I've ever written. Um, wherever I am in the world, I, my, wife ed, my wife's a, a, a copy editor by profession, and I trust her judgment. And, and when she tells me a column's no good, I start over. Um, I How hold, often has she done that? Uh, you know, a couple times a year, she just say, this column doesn't work. And um, uh, I literally hold my breath, waiting to get my column back from my wife. You know. I really love yeah, that. Yeah, uh, um, I love that. No, seriously. And um, she disagreed with my position on Iraq, and I wrote a column about that. Um, you know, and so, uh, and people wrote me, I'm with your wife, you're an idiot, you know, so, um, uh, uh, so, um, the only thing, the, the, so I, I, I know what's going on around yeah. me, you know what right. I mean, uh, and, and sometimes I'm, I, people call me up and interview me and, and challenge me, you know, uh, the only thing I ask of my critics is to actually read what I wrote, because I never just write one column, if it's about Iraq or MBS, the Saudi leader. I'm actually engaging with this subject. And I may not get the perfect balance for you. I'm engaging. These are fluid situations. But underlying them, I'm not just throwing darts. There is a world view behind them that really shapes what I'm doing. I was actually interviewed by a, a British publication. I was in London for Brexit last month. And, and what usually happens, we do the conversation, then they get to the charge sheet. You know. Uh, you supported the Iraq war, you were um, hoping for MBS, you were overexcited about the Arab Spring. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are the charge sheets. And um, I said to the interviewer, I said, you know, it's really interesting. Um, what you just told me is that I was too eager to get rid of a dictator in Iraq. I was too eager to support a dictator in Saudi Arabia. And I was too eager to get rid of all the dictators in the Arab world with the Arab Spring. Either I'm completely messed up, okay, <laughs> or there's a logic here you don't see. Right. And the logic here is a deep conviction that unless pluralism comes to the Arab Muslim world, political pluralism, gender pluralism, and religious pluralism, it's going to fall off the face of the earth. It's going to be Syria. It's going to be Libya. It's going to be all these really bad situations. And so because I believe perfect isn't on the menu there, okay, and um, uh, that when I see an opening or an opportunity uh, to advance pluralism, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to support it. 
And whether it's up from the bottom up, from the top down, from sideways, I'm gonna support it until I think it doesn't work. And um, that's the logic of what I've been pursuing. And Not do you feel that that objective of advancing pluralism yeah. is equivalent to you advancing peace? Oh, absolutely. I think the two absolutely go together because it's both internal peace and external peace. Um, uh, look at Tunisia, uh, the one uh, Arab Spring country. Oh, that was also on the charge sheet because I've, I've actually been screaming we should not be funding Afghanistan, we should be funding Tunisia. So it's actually a logic. I'll, I'll tell you something that's kind of interesting about critics, because um, I've gotten, you know, obviously tons of this. But you know what's interesting? Not one has ever called me up. Not in 40 years. Of all the people hacking away at me, mm -hmm. and say, what, what actually were you thinking? Because you're obviously not actually a warmonger. You know what I mean? So like, what were you thinking? And um, I'll, I'll tell you another story. I, I, my column appears in uh, Shark al-Ausset, which is the leading Arab newspaper. It's published in London, Arabic newspaper. Big deal for me, because my column goes into Arabic, you know. And I have an important audience there. And around 2007, they asked if they could send their media reporter to interview me from London. And he came to my office in Washington. I said, of course, you guys run my column in Arabic. You, anything you mm -hmm. want. And he came to my office in Washington. We sat down. and. Uh, midpoint of the conversation, he said, you know, Mr. Friedman, now we have to talk about Iraq. Because just for those of you who know, I was for the Iraq war for democracy reasons, not WMD reasons. Mm -hmm. So I didn't believe in the WMD argument. I said, if you're going for that, don't go. Only go if you're going to partner with Iraqis to try to build a, a different political order. That was my argument for the war. Um, and by the way, I wouldn't have started, it was not my war, but I, I was trying to say, if you're going to start this war, let's do it for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. So anyways, that was the background. So we did the interview, in the middle of the interview, he said to me, now, Mr. Friedman, I have to ask you, uh, your position on Iraq, that upset a lot of our readers. What do you have to say? And I said, you know, um, he was a young guy, he was Lebanese Saudi, and I said, um, please tell your readers I am sorry. From the bottom of my heart, I am sorry. I thought Arabs were in need of, desirous of, and capable of democracy. I seem to have made a huge mistake. I promise your readers I'll never make that mistake again. Wow. So his face got quite drawn, and um, uh, we went on. It clearly knocked him off his game, and when he left, he pulled me aside. We stood in the doorway of my office. My secretary heard this, and he said, Mr. Friedman, can I say something to you off the record? I said, anything. You guys run my column in Arabic. <laughs> he said, uh, please don't say that. So, you know, there's a lot of stories in the naked city. You know, you can hear from the left or right about the war and different things. Here's the real truth. Do you know how many young Arabs were rooting for us to succeed? Do you think they liked living under Saddam Hussein? Do you think they liked living under a dictator, a murderous dictator? My anger at the Bush administration is how they much they messed it up, how much we disappointed so many people who wanted this to work. Um, and that was my focus. And uh, by the way, my attitude also is, I may have got it completely wrong, which is why Please damn me, criticize me, or whatever. And that's why what you also don't see is me out there saying, I'm, I'm really, I, I wasn't for the war. I didn't believe, you know, oh, you got it wrong. No, I feel responsible for my position. If you like it and understand it, that's great. If you don't, I accept the criticism. But I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, right. this is a logic. And you're paid government. to have that position. And exactly. that's, that's one of the things I'm that I... I'm paid to challenge people. Right. I'm, not, I'm not out there to try to be part of your consensus. Exactly. You know. Right. So as we look at the next generation of reporters and the next generation of peacemaking, peace building, and war, what is your advice to young journalists out there? One is cancel your Twitter account. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, and I, I, I see horrifying things. I see columnists, uh, journalists in the Middle East covering like the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, conflict in Gaza. They write their stories and they immediately go to Twitter to see what's said about them. That is, that's the end of civilization. But I mean, management know, okay. is also pushing that. Management is pushing uh, somewhat to, to, to tweet, and it's just a terrible thing. Because then you start writing for the people who are tweeting about you. And you're, you're looking at them, not what's going on in the ground. You, you have to make hard calls sometimes. Not everything is like equally bad or equally responsible. You have to make hard calls. And if you're worried about what's being said about you, 
Um, so much so that, um, you know, it happens. I, I know Steve Kerr, the coach of the of San Francisco Warriors. Uh, for a tragic reason, I covered his father's assassination. His father was president of the American University in Beirut, and I was the first reporter on the scene when he was killed. So I've known the family all this time. So I talked to Steve every once in a while. He told me an amazing story a couple of years ago. He said that his players at halftime now go into the locker room, take out their cell phones, and see what's said about them on Twitter in the first half. And I thought, that really is the Crazy. sign of the apocalypse. Yeah. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, and so if you're always worried about that, yeah. if that's in your head, then you're not looking at the story. Or you're worried, but if I see this, what's going to happen? I can't emphasize to you how, how bad that is. That, that's sort of the first thing I'd say. Cover the story without fear or favor and call it as you see it. Uh, whether, you, whether you think the Israelis are worse here, the Palestinians are worse, call it as you see it. That's number one. And the second thing I always tell people is, um, look, I, I think to be a good journalist, you need a couple of things. One is, is, first of all, you have to like people. So it happens I really like people, and I um, stop people everywhere. And when people stop me on the street, um, I stop, I engage them, and sometimes I take out my notebook. Um, it, it's not all journalists like people, I have to tell you. you know? um, oh, yeah. uh, so um, that's the first thing. The second thing, though, is that I think to be an effective journalist, you have to be a good listener. And you have to be a good listener for, for two reasons, and the second reason is more important than the first. Uh, the first is what you learn when you listen. Uh, you learn a lot. Um, and all the stories I got wrong were because I was talking when I should have been listening. Um, and the second thing about listening is what you say when you listen. Listening is a sign of respect. And if people think you respect them, it's amazing what they'll let you say to them. And if they think you don't respect them, you can't tell them the sky is gray right now. So I do a lot of, I'm a little Jewish guy from St. Louis Park. I'm one of the most widely read columnists in the Arab world. That is not a natural thing. Um, and, um, uh, and, uh, and it's not because I go around saying, you're all great, you're all wonderful, it's all the Jews' fault. Okay, just the opposite. I'm in their face a lot. But they know one thing about me. I really want them to succeed. I'm not there to put them And you them are down. trying to get it right. Exactly, and I'm trying they to get it right. They probably know yeah. that at their core, even and if they, they're not saying it. And that's why they get mad at me a little bit, because right. they want me some, but both sides do. You know what I mean? Right. We, Israelis the same, because they, they, but they do know one thing, that I will listen, and I'll do deep listening, not just waiting for you to stop talking, but I mean deep listening, where it actually will, will affect me. And so listening is a sign of respect. What you say when you listen is so much more important than what you hear when you listen. Now I'm really paranoid about totally <laughs> listening to it. <laughs> so it's kind of a two-way street though, right? There's the consumer of news. We've spent a lot of time talking about the reporter, the columnist. Consumers have also changed over the decades. What are point, yeah. the responsibilities of the consumer? Um, well, that's a very good question. I, I'm not really, you know, um, How would you that. ideally like them to be? Yeah. Let's um, start there. Well, obviously, you know, I want a country that where people want to um, consume news and they want to consume the best news and even news that disturbs them and opinions that disturb them. So I can, I'll tell you how I start my day. I, I read the New York Times, I read the Washington Post, um, and then I go to Real Clear Politics and Real Clear World. If you've never been there, these are aggregator sites, and they have left, right, and center uh, on politics and from around the world. So I, I can go to Real Clear World and see what developed is from Germany is saying. Uh, I can see what the Hindu Times, you know, the, the Times of India is saying. And I love, I, I want to know what everybody's saying, left, right, and center. And then I'll, I'll figure out, you know, um, where I locate myself. But we have so much narrow casting now where people just read the news or opinion that reinforces their opinion. It's one of the real downsides of the internet that um, uh, I think that the readers I want are my favorite comment when people come up to me on the street is when people say, I never miss your column. I don't always agree, though. Oh, that's my reader. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to always agree, but I want you always to think that there's value in figuring out where you are in relation to what I'm saying. And if you've gotten people to think of things a little that's differently, all, yeah, absolutely. that's a huge win. So I, I went into journalism. You know, a lot of people go into journalism. Some people want to be investigative journalists. Some people want to be business, sports, commentators from the beginning. 
I went into journalism because I really like to be an explainer. A lot of my columns are really just saying, hey, I just was at the border. Here's kind of what I saw. And I'm gonna explain this to you. And because um, I believe in Marie Curie's statement is my, you can put this on my tombstone. Um, we need to understand more so we may fear less. We're in this incredibly complex age of, integ of, of interweaving, of, of globalization, technology, climate, information. A lot of people, they're, they're just really confused by it. I'm confused by it. And what I try to do is go places, explain it to myself, first of all, and then I figure if I understand it and, and can explain it well, other, people's will, other people will, and they will make better decisions. They will fear less because we are in a time and age where there are people out there have a business model to either make us stupid or frightened. They are, that is their business model, to either confuse you or make you frightened. And I went into journalism to combat, that's my idealism. Other people maybe wanted to, to promote peace or, or, or to um, uh, save refuge. God bless them, they're all idealistic. It's, but I went, because I want to, I think I'm good at explaining things, first to myself, and that's where all my opinions start. I'm not sitting in my library smoking a pipe in a cardigan, throwing down, you know, uh, lightning bolts. From really, because I like that image. Yeah. <laughs> I want to think of that when I'm reading your column. Now. No, I, I will tell you, you know, people often say, you know, um, uh, what's it like to be a star at the New York Times? I tell them, you know, that sounds really cool. If you find out, will you tell me? Okay, <laughs> because one good thing about the New York Times, the newspaper is the star. Yeah. Not any of us. And that we've gotten in trouble as a paper when we've had individual reporters who thought they were bigger than the paper. No, no, the paper is the star. And that's why, you know, people think, uh, you know, I do not wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, you are so powerful. You know what I did this Your morning? Your wife would edit that Yeah, right well, away. she would slap me down. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's what I did this morning, because I have a col column in the paper this morning. I actually woke up at 4.30 this morning. First thing I did was read my column, did I get it right? Morning after, did I still feel good about it? Did I get it right? What are the intelligent commenters saying on my column? I'm always in, in absolute anxiety about that to this day. And the reason I have had very few scoops as a reporter, very simple, when I was a reporter, I was so afraid of getting something wrong in the New York Times, you could never confirm a story for me well enough for me to dare to say, this is gonna happen the next day. I am that afraid to this day of the New York Times. Uh, I believe it's a great institution. We make mistakes, but um, uh, we try to correct them when we do. And I am so intimidated to this day of the paper and getting something wrong that um, I, I never dared to actually go out very far. I like what you said about trying to help people fear less. Yeah. Do you think that is something journalism professors could teach current students? Because Look, social media isn't going away. Yeah. I mean, Twitter doesn't care that you're Wish not you on Twitter yeah. yourself, right? It's going to continue to go on. There are all these other social platforms. Do you think if they focused in on that, maybe we could get over some of the hump of just how stray it has gone in objectivity with some reporters? So let me start at a sort of, for me, a more basic level, which is that, so I work for something that's printed on a dead tree, or it was for many years, you know. Um, uh, called a newspaper. And um, uh, to the right of this newspaper um, uh, uh, was a regulator. And the regulator said that if Gustavus wants to run an ad on my dead tree, they have to uh, identify where their money comes from. They can't do it anonymously. And on the other side of my dead tree, I had an editor that said if I spelled Gustavus wrong, I have to correct it on the dead tree. Then on the dead tree, we had people called readers and people called advertisers. And that was our system. Then along came Facebook. They said, no, 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 no. We are not a dead tree. We are a platform. We have nothing to do with dead tree. We're a platform. Um, and therefore, we um, uh, don't need any of your regulators, and we don't need any of your editors. But we want all of your readers and all of your advertisers. And we didn't know what to do, because we were a dead tree. And by the way, they were cool. They only wore t-shirts. They didn't wear ties. Like, um, people like me, and what they said was, don't worry, trust us, trust us, and we trusted them, 
and they completely screwed us over, okay? And that's what happened here. Um, they extended their platform with no regulators and no editors, and they brought you a deformed election. And they helped bring you Sri Lanka, and they helped bring you San Diego, and they helped bring you New Zealand. Um, I Did people do, eat it up? I, I know it's a problem, but me, I don't. And I, I don't like these people. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I think they've been, you know, I did a story, a column a few weeks ago about the college board, the people who run the college board, to do the SAT mm -hmm. exams, and uh, David Coleman, and they had determined over the last few years that, they, that there are really two things every high school graduate, there are many things high school graduates know, but there are two things every high school graduate know, two codes, how to code a computer and the code of the U.S. Constitution. And Mark Zuckerberg is exhibit A of someone who took the first course and didn't take the second. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we've been paying for that. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the Constitution. It's one of my favorite topics. I think it has gotten so bastardized, especially in the last decade. And I get on the soapbox about this. Do you think in this marketplace of ideas, of news, of platforms, that the Constitution just is never going to come back? We're never going to really get back to those fundamentals you know, those First Amendment rights, uh, when we're talking about freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom mm. of speech. Yeah. Well, if that were the case, that would be the end of us, because um, it is the code that um, defines and, and uh, shapes our society. One of the columns I did this year, again, surprising to a lot of people um, on the left, is I did a shout out for Justice Roberts. Not a natural thing for me either, or for the New York Times editorial page. And I gave him a shout out after Donald Trump said basically, you know, they're Republican judges and Democratic judges. And Justice Roberts, unprecedented, came out and said, no, there actually aren't. They're not Obama judges and Trump judges. They're just judges. Now, you can say, that's not true, whatever. I don't really care. He came out and called out the president in defense of the integrity and neutrality of the rule of law in this country. And I gave him a shout out for that. And that's also part of being, um, I think, an effective columnist. I don't do that just to surprise people. I do it because that's what I feel. And I don't start my day saying, What's my, what team am I on today? Let's see, what's Team Democrat doing today? What do they need? I'm not on anybody's team. And because of that, you're often attacked by both sides. Now, in the Middle East, when you're attacked by both sides, one of the dumbest things I hear from Middle East reporters is, both sides are criticizing me. I must be doing something right. Well, frankly, any knucklehead can write in a way that offends both sides. That is, <laughs> that is, not, a, that is not a trick, okay, I can tell you. Um, the trick is actually writing in a way that both sides take seriously, find compelling, um, want, want the support of, and that's where I uh, come down. You know, I had to think a lot about this because I was the first Jewish person the New York Times ever sent to cover the Arab world. And then I was the first Jewish person they ever sent to cover Israel. They had a ban on both, okay? And so I had to think about this a lot. And I had to think about what is objectivity? What is objectivity? And so traditionally, I think a lot of people think objectivity is like being a juror in a jury trial. You really want to have an objective reporter in the Middle East? Then take a Gentile from northern Montana, plunk them down in the Middle East, they won't have any connection to anybody, and they'll give you the best reporting. But that equates actually objectivity with ignorance. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I don't think that's true. I think objectivity is a tension between understanding and disinterest. You know, if I don't understand you, if I don't look at the world almost through your eyes, I can't write a fair column about you or news story. But if I only look through your eyes, if I don't maintain some disinterest, I also can't write a fair story. So guess what? It's a constant tension. And guess what? Sometimes I may be more understanding to one side one day in one column. Sometimes I may be more you know, disinterested. And people want to seize on one thing you wrote, and then they factor out everything else. And I tell them, oh, I'm in a conversation. I'm in a dialogue. I'm not in a one-shot thing. Some days I may hear. Some days I'm going to be there. You, know? um, you want to know what I think about MBS? Read all eight columns I wrote. Okay, not just one. I'm in a, I'm in a process here. I'm trying to work this out. Um, and because underlying it is a pluralism project, which is my real project. Now, that's why I always tell people, um, if you want to know what I think about anything, read my columns for a year. If at the end of the year you think I'm really misguided, tell me, I'll listen to that. But because you didn't like my column on August 8th, 
Well, that wasn't my only column. I didn't just stop there. So you could freeze it in aspic and then beat me over the head with it, okay? Because I'm actually in a dialogue. So I really don't care about that. Yeah. Um, and so you have to... You have to have a thick skin. You have to have a thick skin. I mean, yeah. you have to, you know, on, on, believe me, everything I'm telling you today, this didn't just come overnight. Right. There are days I came home, went into the closet, and would scream about things written about me. I would scream to my wife, you know. But eventually, I, I grew up, I got older, um, I built a body of work, and my attitude, and this is what I tell all young, you know, journalists, is that you are what you do in the end, all right? And my view is, if you build a diamond-hard reality around your reporting, no amount of criticism will stick. And if you don't, no amount of spinning will save you. So you might as well focus on building the diamond hard reality. That's why I never respond to critics. Not because I'm indifferent, but because I look at something and I say, that must have taken you a day to write about me, maybe two days. I'm not going to waste two days on you. Catch me if you can. I'm off to the next thing. Oh, but I'm listening. Yeah. I'm, not, uh, I'm not, you know, but arguing with people that my column is really better than you think, that's a kind of a fruitless exercise. So knowing what we know about some of the backstory to how you got to be Thomas Friedman yeah. of the New York Times, is the world set up in a way that someone in, in this group here or someone in the world could be Thomas Friedman and, and have this exact, I call it idyllic, career? Yeah. Obviously, you're very thorough. You work hard. Mm -hmm. But is the world set up for another person to follow in footsteps like this? Well, I have to be honest, I'm really glad I had my career when I had it, you know. I got to be first a reporter at the New York Times and learn real reporting values and be a foreign correspondent at the New York Times, be the diplomatic correspondent, travel with Secretary of State Jim Baker um, for 750,000 miles at the end of the Cold War, be the chief White House correspondent, be the chief economics correspondent. So I got all these master's degrees along the way and really in these different subjects. Uh, and then be a columnist um, with that platform. It's much harder now um, uh, to start out as a columnist, you know, and to be um, on the, uh, you know, the Gustavus paper and then um, uh, blog and then get hired. There, that is a pathway, but it's like one in a million, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when I was in Beirut in the summer of 82 at the Commodore Hotel, which was the journalist hotel there, Here's who I saw when I looked around the lobby. I saw r reporters from AP, UPI, Reuters, DPA, the German press agency, and AFP, the French uh, uh, news agency. I saw reporters from CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, BBC. I saw um, uh, reporters from Time Magazine, US News World Report, um, and Newsweek. And then I saw foreign correspondents who were sent by the Dallas Morning News, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Baltimore Sun, the Boston Globe, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. All those people had foreign correspondence. When I was last in the Commodore Hotel, I looked in the mirror and I only saw myself. Wow. All those jobs have disappeared. That's the downside. Upside is you can declare yourself as a blogger and go to Beirut right now, or go to, um, uh, to Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And if you write compellingly, you could have a global following. So I don't want to say it's worse, I just want to say it's different. You right. know what I mean? Well, and, that um, also brings in the consumer again. Yeah. Because consumers, I don't know that they are as discerning yeah. as they need to be. Well, that's, that's a different thing. You do have to understand. I mean, one of the frightening things is people will sometimes say to you, but, 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 but I read it on the internet as if that settles the bar back, you know, because it comes in this patina of technology, you think it must be right. Um, and um, uh, it's, um, that's really dangerous, you know. Um, you have to, I think there's, if there's one thing that we should teach every first grader, it's digital civics. That they understand that the internet is an open sewer of untreated, unfiltered information. Oh my God, it's got diamonds. And I roots. love that visual. Yeah. It's so uh, that's true. Right. It's disgusting, uh, it's got, but it's, it's really true. It is. It's got diamonds and rubies and gold and silver. And it's got rusty nails, toxic materials, broken glass, and rusty cans. And if you don't build this internal software into your kids to understand the difference between one and the other, we will not be able to sustain this democracy. Because that, that river is just getting wider and rushing faster and faster. What is your advice 
Go ahead. <laughs> what is your advice for people who don't necessarily want to go into news, don't care about some of the, the lofty ideas that you have to deal with every day, but they do care about peace and they do care about their neighbor, even if they don't right now care about their neighbor over in Sri Lanka or Russia or Australia, they do care about their community. Well, you know, again, I think that whether it's, it's peace or democracy um, or a thriving economy, it's got to be built on a foundation of truth, you know. Um, uh, and, and that's where I've tried to interface. I mean, look, I, um, uh, I've been more proactive sometimes in this department. I, I launched the Air Peace Initiative. Um, uh, came in a, uh, so you can do this as a columnist. So back in, in, um, in, the, two, in the late 1990s and 2000s, um, I developed a, a, a sort of column uh, a technique. Of, I would occasionally write letters from Bill Clinton, who was president, to other world leaders. And literally, memo from Bill Clinton to world <laughs> leader X. And they were really fun, and a lot of world leaders thought they were from the president. And um, <laughs> it caused him huge trouble, and, um, which I really enjoyed. And it was... Um, <laughs> uh, because you have to explain, I, it's not from me, I didn't do, but they were really well reported, so like people thought, I, I once wrote a letter from Clinton to the president of Syria saying, and by the way, you know, whenever we meet, the chairs are like this, and I have a crick in my neck from talking to you like this, okay? And the next time they met, the chairs were face to face, <laughs> so, uh, so they were reading it. Anyways, after 9-11 happened, um, uh, I, so I, I, when 9-11 happened, it was in my Journalism career is the biggest thing that happened to me, and um, uh, I thought it was, it was the worst thing I felt happened to my country, and we went off in some terrible directions after it, and, um, uh, and of all the things I've done as a journalist, the thing I'm proudest of is win winning the Pulitzer Prize for commentary on 9-11, because there were a lot of people commenting on 9-11. Mm -hmm. So um, what I did um, after 9-11, although I, I, I did two things. One is I went to war with Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, I blamed Saudi Arabia and its ideology for the people who perpetrated 9-11. I put them in the dock. Um, and uh, I, I, I did it deliberately and knowingly and proudly. Um, and so uh, something a lot of people have forgotten today, you know. Um, and the second thing I did was think of how do we put this thing on a more constructive path. So I thought of writing a column from George W. Bush to the leaders of the Arab League, asking them to put forward a peace plan of full peace for full Israeli withdrawal from uh, all the occupied territories and East Jerusalem in return for full trade, commerce, and tourism. So that year, in January of 2002, the Davos World Economic Forum was held in New York in honor of 9-11 at the Waldorf Astoria. And I went and I ran into Amr Musa, who was head of the Arab League, as a friend of mine, and I pulled him aside and I said, um, I'm thinking of writing this column to the head of the Arab League, uh, heads of the Arab League, uh, what do you think? He said, do it, do it. And then I met with Andre Azulay, who was the Jewish advisor of the King of Morocco. I said, Andre, what do you think of this idea? He said, do it, do it. So I went back and I wrote a column from President Bush to the leaders of the Arab world, calling on them to put forward a peace plan to Israel calling for full withdrawal in return for full normalization, trade, and tourism. In between writing that column, um, uh, or after I wrote that column, I got a call from Adel al Joubert, who was then the spokesman of the Saudi embassy in Washington, um, who is now the foreign minister, has been, and he said, um, would you like to come to Saudi Arabia? You're beating our brains in. Why don't you come and at least talk to people? And I said, I'll come. I'm, uh, that's always my philosophy, you know, always engage with people. Uh, so I went over there. I toured around the country for uh, a week. We had some really bruising conversations, one of which I got up and walked out of. Um, uh, and, um, and it was, I was, I was the one angry person. And, um, uh, but at the end of the week, uh, then Crown Prince Abdullah asked to see me. So we went, we had dinner first, and then at midnight, we went to his house in Riyadh, in his horse farm. And he sat there, I sat here, and Adel sat here and translated. 
And the first thing he said was, you broke into my drawer. He said, what are you talking about, your highness? He said, you broke into my drawer. Your peace plan, that was my idea. So I said, well, tell me about it. Um, and for three hours, we talked about, he basically regurgitated my peace plan, but never mind, <laughs> that was his idea. So we got done, and uh, at three in the morning, uh, we were standing up, and I said, your highness, this is so important, you need to share this with the world. He said, no, no, you just put it out uh, 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 your, yourself. I said, no, no, you, you, you put it out. He said, no, no, you put it out. I said, no, no, you put it out. Um, so he's, we finally agreed that um, I would write up the interview, what he said, and he would look at it. And if he felt comfortable having it on the record, he would say so. So I went back to my room. I didn't sleep. I wrote it up. I faxed it to Otto the next morning. And about 2 in the afternoon, they faxed it back, and they said, go with it. Now I know I've got something really big. And, um, uh, and then he asked me to see some of his brothers. So he first wanted me to see his brother, the interior minister, um, Nayef um, uh, bin Abdulaziz, the father of Mohammed bin Nayef, who later became crown prince, although Mohammed bin Nayef was there. And I went to see him. Um, I sat down in front of him, and the first thing he said to me, we'd never met before, is it true that the Jews control all the banks in America? Wow. And at first I thought, I wanted to say, you mean you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, we thought it was a secret. You know? <laughs> so um, I kind of wiggled out of that. But people believe crazy stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. And you got to understand some of that, you know. And I sort of deflected that. But it became clear to me his brother hadn't told him about the peace plan he gave to me, which is going to appear in Sunday's paper. Then he asked me to see another his minister of information, I didn't say anything, and, he did, and it cleared me he didn't know. So now I realize I'm in the middle of a coup d'etat, because he was crown prince. His older brother was, had dementia, oh. and so he was actually stepping out. So um, uh, it was confirmed on Saturday night, my column's already in, I got a call from Adel, and he said, um, uh, Tom, do you have Ari Fleischer's phone number? He was Bush's spokesman. I said, Adel, don't you have an embassy in Washington? He said, we're not using the embassy. Now I know I'm in a coup d'etat. And I just told him one thing. Otto, I'm staying here till Monday because I care about one thing. How you translate this into Arabic on the Saudi press agency. And if you screw me, I will screw you back on Wednesday. Because the last thing I wanted was me in the New York Times quoting the crown prince with a peace plan to Israel and them saying, oh no, he just completely. Right. So Otto personally translated came out on Sunday, and then it went all over the world. The Arab League called a, a meeting immediately in Beirut, and it became the Arab Peace Initiative. So, yeah, I've done my own kind of peace work, um, you know, um, and it's still the only peace plan the Arab world has ever produced. And so, every once in a while, I'll, I'll step out like that, you know, but mostly what I'm trying to do is um, uh, try to present the reality and the implications of the absence of peace if you think about Israeli-Palestinian, um, uh, if you think about um, Iraq, Syria, Libya, you know, um, uh, I think just by doing your job um, of, of being a reporter on what's going on on the ground, hopefully you inform that. There are authentically bad people, though, who don't want peace. I don't think the people who th flew those planes into uh, the Twin Towers and killed 3,000 of our brothers and sisters, I don't think they were... That was about a misunderstanding. You know, people right. believe bad stuff sometimes. Right, or they're just not conditioned for peace. There's no hope yeah. in their life. Well, wow, it's so great to get the story behind the story. I like to wind down some of my conversations on my radio show with kind of a, a fire round. Mm -hmm. So these next questions are just coming to me as they come to me, right. have not been vetted by Thomas Friedman. <laughs> so he can't really be responsible yeah. for his answers. But... <laughs> I want to start with who have you not interviewed yet, who you really, really want to interview? It's hmm. a really, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I've never interviewed Putin, and I think that would be a really interesting interview. What would be your first question? Um, how do you define success for you and for Russia? 
It's a good question. Messing in other people's elections? You get off on that? You know? <laughs> um, uh, well, that would be that right? next one. That's <laughs> the follow-up. Probably be the last question. Yeah, but. I was going to say, you may want to ask a few mm. before you get to that punchline. <laughs> what do you think your wife would say about your body of work? Um, uh, well, I mean, she edited be, it all, yeah. but... Um, he may have gotten it right, he may have gotten it wrong, but his motto was always, if you don't go, you don't know. You can call my husband many things, but not lazy. She's a smart woman. Yeah. Yeah. What would you, other than that quote you shared with us earlier, I was listening, what would you like it to say on your tombstone? Um, that, um, uh, you know, I, I really did two things. One is that... Um, I tried to get it right, and all my real failings, and I recognize some of the things I supported didn't work and didn't happen, because they came because I was always looking for Minnesota. And, um, and maybe wishing, whether it was in Iraq or Libya or Syria or Saudi Arabia, you know, that I would find and be able to recreate uh, the kind of values and ethics uh, and pluralism that I grew up in. Nothing's influenced me more than my upbringing here. Um, so that, that's what I would like them to say. I want you to give a real quick teaser because I have more questions to ask and I know we're running out of time. Give people a quick teaser about your Wilmer project. Um, so I, um, one of the things I got interested in my last book, the, the cliche about America is that we're a country divided between two coasts. Two coasts that are liberalizing, pluralizing, globalizing, modernizing, and diversifying. And then there's flyover America where everyone's high on opioids, voted for Trump, and waiting for 1950 to come back. Okay. <laughs> so that's um, so that's the cliche. And um, teacher liked that one. Well, yeah. She's smiling. Yeah. <laughs> so you only have to be, as I tell my colleagues in Washington, you only have to be from flyover America to know that ain't true. Um, so what I've discovered really is that the story of America today is that we're actually a checkerboard. We're a checkerboard of communities that are rising from the bottom up and communities that are actually collapsing from the bottom down into um, opioid abuse, a divorce, and suicide. Those, both those stories are real. Mm -hmm. And so the journey I've been on since my last book, uh, since I wrote the last book, is to try to understand, excuse me, why does one community rise and another fall. I think it's about the most important thing I can do right now, and then share that. That's why I ended my book going back to St. Louis Park, you know, and saying, well, what was working there that maybe I could tease out and then share with others? That was the whole idea. And so since then, I've been on a journey around the country visiting communities. So um, uh, I did a tour of the state of Tennessee. They invited me to Nashville, Knoxville, um, and in Memphis. I shared in Wyoming, Fort Lauderdale. Um, and then last Ju June, I went to, um, at last April, I was invited to give a book talk in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Never been there, by a group called the Hourglass Foundation. And um, my agent um, called me a week before the talk and said, um, you have to do a 90-minute reception before the talk. I said, Carlton, you're killing me. 90 minutes standing <laughs> there? You know, you're killing me, you know. No, that's part of the deal. So I go, and I go to this reception, and um, people start introducing themselves. Hi, I'm from the Lancaster Housing Coalition. I'm from the Lancaster Anti-Poverty Coalition. I'm from the Lancaster Lead Abatement Coalition. I'm from the Lancaster Health Coalition. Start to realize, wow, I'm in a pretty cool place. And Hourglass was because they had formed a community group, right, like Itasca in, in Minneapolis, that the hour was late. So before I left for my lecture, I had already arranged to come back. And I, I did a 5,000 word column about Lancaster. Um, and uh, the theme of it was that, um, so I believe we're in the middle of multiple climate changes right now. We're in a change, uh, 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 change of the climate of the climate. We're in the change of the climate of globalization, going from interconnected to interdependent. We're in a change of the climate of technology. Machines are acquiring the attributes of human beings. And we're in a change in the, environment, the climate of information. Every individual is now a paparazzi, a reporter, and a filmmaker without an editor, libel lawyer, or filter. Those are multiple climate changes. So in my book, what I, what I did was say to myself, well, if we're in the middle of climate changes, what do you want when the climate changes? You want two things. You want resilience. You need to take a blow. 
um, uh, and you also want propulsion, you want to be moving ahead, you want to be curled up under this chair with you saying, Tom, come out, the climate change is over, okay? <laughs> so then I thought about, well, who do I interview about how you get resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? And then I realized I knew this woman. She was 3.8 billion years old, her name was Mother Nature, and she dealt with more climate changes than anybody. So I called her up, made an appointment, went out to see her. And I said, Mother Nature, how do you produce resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? She said, well, Tom, I have to tell you, everything I do, I do unconsciously, but these are my strategies. Uh, first of all, she said, I'm incredibly adaptive. In my world, it's not the strongest that survive, not the smartest that survive, it's the most adaptive that survive. And I teach that through a lesson I call natural selection. You may have heard of it. I said, yes, I have. Uh, <laughs> secondly, she said, I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. Wherever I see a blank space in nature, I fill it with a plant or animal perfectly adapted to that niche. I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. This will end in Wilmer, I promise you, okay? Um, uh, third, she said, I'm incredibly pluralistic. Oh, Tom, she said, I'm the most pluralistic person you've ever met. I try 20 different species of everything. I see who wins. And she told me something interesting. She said, I noticed, Tom, that my most diverse ecosystems are also my most resilient and propulsive ecosystems. I love pluralism and diversity. Uh, Fourth, she said, I'm incredibly sustainable. Nothing's wasted. Everything is food, eat, food, poop, seed, eat, food, poop, seed. Nothing is wasted. Um, a fifth, she said, I'm incredibly hybrid and heterodox in my thinking. I'll try any trees with any soils, any bees with any flowers. Uh, six, she said, I'm a lifelong learner, and I turn all my learning into new DNA. And uh, seven, she said, I noticed that my most healthy ecosystems all network together and create complex adaptive networks that maximize their resilience and propulsion. And lastly, she said, I do believe, Tom, in the laws of bankruptcy. I kill all my failures, I return them to the great manufacturer in the sky, and I take their energy to nourish my successes. So my argument is that the country, the community, the university that most closely mirrors Mother Nature's killer apps is the one that will thrive and have resilience and propulsion in this age of multiple climate changes at once. Now let's go to Wilmer, okay, and Lancaster. What was happening in Lancaster. What was the key thing happening there? Is they created what I came to name a complex adaptive coalition, where the business community partnered with the education community, partnered with the philanthropic community, partnered with the social services and social entrepreneurship community, partnered with the city government to create a coalition to thrive in these multiple climate changes. And there were two unique attributes of these coalitions. One, you check your politics at the door. Do not come into this room with your politics. We have one politics here, it's called what works. And the second is that they're all led by leaders without authority. These are people in the community who just stepped up and said, not gonna happen in my town. We're gonna build a complex adapt. We're not waiting for Washington. We're gonna build it together in our town, and it was all leaders without authority. And that's what I saw in Lancaster, now Wilmer. So I had an aunt and uncle who moved to Wilmer in 1949 um, to start a little steel company there. And I actually had been going to Wilmer for 50 years. Um, and after I did Lancaster, I was sort of wondering, I wonder what's happened in Wilmer. It's a big enough city, west central Minnesota, I'm hearing all this trouble about rural areas. I wonder what's happening in Wilmer. And one day I got visited in Washington by a woman named Dana Mortensen who runs a great group called World Savvy and they do great education work in communities. She told me she's working in Red Wing. I said, do you do any work in Wilmer by any chance? She said, no, but I know how to get you in there. So we set Monday, I know it's coming for this, to go to Wilmer. Meanwhile, when I'd gone to Lancaster, I took one of my best Israeli friends, a guy named Giddy Greenstein, who um, is, a, is probably Israel's leading social entrepreneur, and he came with me to Lancaster. And we jointly interviewed everybody because I wanted another set of eyes and ears. So I called Giddy, I said, Giddy, you ever been to West Central Minnesota? Um, <laughs> I have an idea for you. So last Monday we got, and then Dana said our key contact there is Hamza Warfa, who was just named by the governor as deputy head of uh, economic uh, you know, uh, development and workforce in Minnesota. So this was like the opening of a joke. Okay, so a Somali, an Israeli, and two Minnesotans walk into a bar, okay? And um, so the four of us go off to Wilmer um, in Dana's car, and we start at the high school. Amazing high school, the diversity. Wilmer's now about 
a fifth Somali and Latino. Now, I told them going up that I never forgot, probably 50 years ago, my aunt coming to Minneapolis and saying to me, are you sitting down? You, you are sitting down. <laughs> she said, Tom, I heard someone speaking Spanish in the grocery store. <laughs> It could have been Martian for her, okay? I mean, that was like... Now, fast forward to Monday. We go into the high school. They have on the, in the front lobby a giant world map, flat, made of steel. And every year, the students come and put a pin in from the different countries they're from. Forty different pins. Wow. And that map was donated by my aunt and uncle's steel company. And you couldn't make that up. My aunt, who 50 years ago was just blown away that someone was speaking this strange language. And now that's the map in the school. And the story of Wilmer is all about, can they build a complex adaptive coalition to manage these two challenges they have that are interrelated? They have a terrible employment problem. They, are, they need work. If you can fog up a mirror, you can get a job in, in Wilmer. Okay. <laughs> okay. By the way, as That's a, a great selling yeah, point right as, there. As, Maybe as that's a, a bumper sticker. As a scientist or, uh, you know, working at Genio. I mean, they, they need everything, you know? And they can't get it unless they manage inclusion. Because mm -hmm. the labor's coming from a very different demographic, first Latino and now Somali, and not just Somali, a, a lot of uh, African, and, so, and some Asian. And so what you're seeing is a community that was 99% white, a Protestant Catholic, struggling um, with um, this, these two challenges. And the towns in Minnesota that are going to make it are the ones that can make that transition to a very different kind of inclusion um, and a different kind of pluralism. And the ones that can't won't because they won't have the labor. And the story of Wilmer is the story of Minnesota, and the story of Minnesota is the story of the world. I love it. So. I love it. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Friedman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, did a great job. Thank you. I'll be on your, your bar. <laughs>